Putin uses a uh, strategy that is not, not un unlike the strategy used by the Titanic. And that is, in the Titanic, there were bulkheads. And they separated the space into different compartments so that as water rushed in, the idea was that it wouldn't go to the next compartment. But there, the bulkheads were not complete. They didn't go to the top. So actually, as water rushed in, it went over the top of the bulkhead, and it went to the next compartment. Um, and uh, I, you know wh why they didn't go to the top, I don't, I don't know. Um, in the brain, we can't go to the top. So it is very similar to having these different compartments where pressure can build up. In that case, water built up. In the case of the brain, pressure builds up, but it's kept within one compartment. And the way that, that we separate one compartment from another is using not just dura, but a fold of dura. So it's a double thickness of dura. And there are two double fold, there are two folds of dura. One is the Folk's cerebri that separates the right hemisphere from the left hemisphere. And the second one is called the tentorium or the tentorium cerebelli. I think it's always um, referred to as the tentorium. And this tentorium sep it, it falls between, is a fold of dura between the cerebellum underneath and the occipital lobe above. So, because of these two different folds, what we have are three compartments in the nervous system. The infratentorial space, which is the brainstem, the supratentorial left, and the supratentorial right. Okay, so there's supratentorial above the, the tentorium, and that is further divided by the Falx cerebri into a left and a right hemisphere. So, the point of, or, or a, an advantage of this uh, setup is that if pressure builds up in the, say, right hemisphere, it does not automatically get communicated to the brainstem, where throughout evolutionary time, if the, bra if the brainstem, um, if there's pressure on the brainstem, the person dies. Now we have some modern uh, ability to keep people alive, but, uh, but throughout evolutionary time, that was, that was the end. And so this bulkhead of the tentorium prevented that. Now, of course, as with the Titanic, so with the bulkheads of the cranium, they can be overcome. There can be too much pressure. And when that, effect, when that occurs, there's something called mass effect. So here's a hemorrhagic stroke. And what you can see is that, and this is a pretty mild one. There, there are much more extreme versions, but I, I put in a pretty mild one. Um, what you can see is that the, the pressure buildup has pushed things off to the side. And this is called mass effect. And so here is uh, the, the, the um, uh, thalamus, and the thalamus should be right to the left of the midline, but it's displaced off to the off much farther laterally. Uh, the both mammillary bodies they should be split by the midline, but they're both located on the left side. So this is a mass effect that is pushing stuff over uh, to the side. Now these mass effect the mass effect the increase in intracranial pressure in one compartment can be enough that there's a a herniation of the brain. And there are four types of herniations. So let's go to the board for a moment. So the four types of herniations, the first one that I'll, I'll tell you about is the falcine, and that means a herniation under the falcs. So for example, the, the, mo the lowest part of the cerebral hemisphere of the cortex is the cingulate gyrus. So if that cingulate gyrus slips underneath the falcs, that would be a falcine, falcine her, herniation. As it turns out, a good portion of these falcine herniations appear to be asymptomatic. So it's not necessarily anything that um, is going to really be a problem. Another type of, uh, of um, herniation is where the central part of the forebrain, so basically the hypothalamus, 
slips back toward pressing on the brainstem down the center of the brain. And this is very uh, dangerous because we need our brainstem. Anything that's gonna press on the brainstem is not gonna work. So that's a, that's a big problem. Another one that is a big problem is tonsillar uh, herniation. And that is where essentially the midline, the back of the midline of the cerebellum slips out the foramen magnum. Now this is not unusual. And one of the reasons it's not unusual is because people have what's called a Chiari malformation, where the, where the cerebellum is, is sort of headed that way anyway. Um, and, and so in people with Chiari malformation, hopefully that gets caught young. There can be a neurosurgical treatment, which is effective. I've had um, students that have had Chiari malformations that were fixed by our neurosurgeons here at, at University of Chicago. Um, and there are neurosurgeons all over the world that can fix these um, and decrease the likelihood of this tonsillar uh, uh, herniation. If you have a tonsillar herni herniation, the possibility exists that there's too much pressure on the junction between the medulla and the spinal cord. And what goes, what critical pathway goes between the medulla and the spinal cord? Think about it, think about it. Breathing. So remember that the phrenic motor neurons exist in, in uh, C3, C4, but they get their instructions from the medulla. That connection has to, that connection from the medulla to the C3, C4 motor neurons that innervate the diaphragm, that has to be intact. If there's too much pressure, those axons say, no, I'm not gonna work, and, and that's gonna be a medical emergency. So that's a big problem. Now, finally, there is a, um, a, an uncle herniation. So this, we're looking at the base of the brain. Here's the front, here's the back, this is the temporal lobe. And on the medial side of the temporal lobe is this little outpouching, which is called the uncus. So this is the uncus. If there's a lot of pressure in the, in the supratentorial fossa on this side, that uncus can slip underneath the tentorium and press on the brainstem. And the first thing that it comes to is, is right there. You see that little cranial nerve right there? That is cranial nerve three, oculomotor. So an uncle herniation is gonna press on uh, cranial nerve three. And how are you gonna know that cranial nerve three is a problem? Well, you're gonna know from a variety of, well, first of all, are you gonna, are you gonna ask the person, uh, can you read? Do you have a near triad? You know you're not because that person if there's enough uh, increase in intracranial pressure in the anterior fossa, this person is, is at best confused and at worst unconscious. So you're not going to ask them whether they can read. Instead, you're going to do a few things. You're going to look at their eyes. You're going to see that they have a, a droopy eyelid. That's not that unusual because they could be unconscious. You're going to, more importantly, look at their pupil. And if it is blown and unresponsive, you, you have a absolute medical emergency. This is um, an uncle herniation and this can lead, this can uh, have a very poor, out, this has a poor outcome. In fact, it might be too late by the time you get that, but you simply have to know that any, any um, sign of an uncle herniation is a medical emergency. Other sign, another sign of, of this, besides the blown and unresponsive pupil, is a down and out eye. And when we look at gaze control, we'll understand a little bit more why the eye is displaced to a down and out position. Okay, so in the next section, we're gonna look at bleeds, bleeds that are within the cranium that, actually, that bleed into spaces that are either actual or potential. Mm -hmm.